presentation. The next presentation will be given by Vassal Peck and it will be about concurrency. Hello everybody. Welcome. Let's talk about fruit. Let's talk about concurrency fruit. Fruit that lows, uh, hangs pretty low so that we can uh, effectively use it to create concurrent applications without too much effort. Uh, I'm, I'm Václav Beck. I work at JetBrains in, in Prague. But the talk that I'll talk about, well, the stuff that I'll talk about today was inspired mostly by my work on GPaaS, which is an open source project I work on. It stands, GPaaS stands for Groovy Parallel System. So it's a concurrency library for Groovy, the programming language. Now, before we dive into concurrency abstractions, I have something frightening to show you. Because typically when people are frightened, they pay more attention. So I prepared something to frighten you at the beginning. Now, So I'll write a short piece of code that will be very straightforward. So it's basically a for loop through a collection of images which I want to process. And if you run this code, and at the same time, if you look at what the CPU is doing, you realize the CPU is not being very busy. The images are being processed one by one as I, as I programmed by the CPU is working to like 14% of its utilization, which is not really much. You know, obviously looking at this, you realize there are much better ways, ways to spend money than buying a quad-core laptop. And you know, there's nothing you can do about this code. Well, this is for They taught me at school, this is the way to write code. And surprisingly, they still teach for loops at school for some reason. Obviously, this is the culprit. This is the reason why we have to change the way we write code. The CPUs are getting multi-core, you probably know that. And not only the CPUs in laptops and desktops and servers, but also in mobile phones and tablets. So we have to really change the way we think about code, we structure it, and, and the way we write it. Um, now, how many of you know Java? Everybody, okay, well, here's a test. Now, is this class threat safe? You know, if you create instances of this class from multiple threads, will it work? Will it correctly count instances? Who thinks it, it is not threat safe? Raise your hand. Okay, it is not threat safe. Because if you invoke this code from multiple threads, <coughs> so they will, they will call the constructor, so they will call the counter on a static field at the same time, and the field is not protected in any way. So you might end up with pretty surprising values in that field. So you have to protect it. You have to lock, you have to s signal that you want to do something to a shared piece of memory so that other threads will wait until you finish. So you have to synchronize, right? Is it correct now? Who thinks it isn't correct? Right, it is not threat safe because you have to synchronize on the class because the field is static. Now, I was testing you for a reason. You know, I wanted to claim that these primitives that we have in Java are too low level for being efficient and being, being secure as a programmer. You know, this is a minor tweak in code, just minor change, but the impact on correctness of the code is huge. So you make a minor change somewhere, a minor mistake, and your program will fail. And it will fail randomly. That's the worst thing. You know, it won't. It might not fail during the test phase. It might fail at production. And there's no way to test this code for correctness. OK, let's move on. So I believe you know, the, the, the stuff that we have available in Java is too, way, uh, way too low level. So we, get, we might get deadlocks, live locks, starvations, and other nasty beats. I would even claim that this quote is quite true. You know, if you write code, or if you have an application that's multi-threaded, it's just a matter of time when you run it on hardware with, with enough parallelism for the problems in parallel uh, scheme to kind of to show up. Luckily, uh, people have been working on 
parallel abstractions for years in the parallel uh, IT business. But now when even uh, mainstream hardware is becoming parallel, we need to adopt these abstractions and use them in mainstream programming. So today I would like to focus on some of those. Those that impose least impact on our code. So those that we can use effectively, like parallel collections, fork join, and, and data flow. But let's start with something very straightforward. Let's start from, from the ground up. So stuff that we have already in Java, uh, thread pools. So let's look at them for, for a second. So this piece of code here that we have, now let's turn it into, into concurrent code. So how about just processing these images uh, concurrently? So we make a runnable around, around that run method. We need a thread pool so that we can run the runnables on. So now we have a thread pool and we have a runnable. So now we can run runnable on that pool by just calling submit. So now the code is a little bit more clumsy than it was before, which is unfortunate. But when you run the code, now you get all images being processed in parallel. Well, not all of them, but eight of them. And the CPU is utilized much better. Well, it was more visible in the first group of images because then we didn't have eight of them. So now you see all cores are busy calculating. Each of them has one image and they process them. Now, when you submit something to, uh, to a pool, you get back a future, which is sort of handle that you have to that asynchronous calculation. So you can use that future to ask whether it's canceled or done. You may cancel it or you may uh, get the value optionally with a timeout. So you get the result of the asynchronous calculation. In our case, it, we are calling it on a runnable, so we get back now. But still, at least this will block you until the calculation is finished. Now notice, you know, there is in the code, there's a lot of clutter that you, we have to add in order to have this computation running asynchronously. So in Groovy, we made it much simpler. So basically, all the stuff that you saw is hidden behind this. But you know, I don't want to force you to learn Groovy. How many of you actually know Groovy? I'm curious. OK, good, excellent. But this is not targeted for Groovy developers. Don't worry. If you're a Java programmer, stay there. Stay in this room. Don't worry. Now, let's look inside thread pools for a while. You know, the thread pool that I was using here was intern internal looks like this. So you have a queue into which you submit tasks, and then you have a bunch of threads on the other end, and they pick stuff from the queue and, and perform it. However, this design has a flaw. As the number of threads increases, this end of the queue becomes pretty hot, especially if you have very short living tasks in the queue, then you might end up with threads fighting for access to the queue. So they might spend more time just waiting for being allowed to read the next task than processing the, the task itself. So this design is sort of obsolete. And the new design that is available in Java 7 should be preferred. So these thread pools are called fork join for a reason which we get to later. But internally, uh, they look differently. Each thread has its <coughs> own queue. So when you submit a task, the task goes to one of those queues. It might be round robin. It might be the shortest one, whatever. And the thread will pick tasks only from its own queue. So it doesn't compete with the other threads. You, you don't have to have a lock here. So it just reads stuff from its own queue. Well, and if the queue is empty, then there's a load, load balancing mechanism called work, work stealing when the, the thread goes and steals work from another queue but it goes and steals it from the other end of the queue so that it, again, avoids fighting with the owner of the queue. So each thread works with, with its own queue. Now, the name for fork join thread pools comes from fork join algorithms. And fork join algorithms are a way to solve hierarchical problems uh, concurrently. Now, if you look at a tree, that's a beautiful parallel data structure, isn't it? 
You know, if you look at the second level, for example, you have two independent subtrees. So you can have two threads running at the same time. On the third level, you can have four threads running at the same time. Each of them have separate part of the tree so they don't interfere with, with one another. And this is just a binary tree. Typically, the branching factor could be like 32, when you could have 32 threads running independently right from the top, from the second level. Uh, well, I've got a demo for full join. Unfortunately, I'm afraid the resolution is too small for it, but I'll give it a try. Here we go. Nah, I don't think I can make it. Oh, oh. nah. Well, I can try to make it smaller if that helps. Nah. I won't give it too much time. Just last attempt. Yeah, hey. So let's see. Yeah, merge sort. I've got, uh, I've got an array of numbers and I wanna sort it using merge sort. So this time I'm, I'm sorting the array with one thread. And well, I can't probably show you more but it will eventually come back, don't worry. How many of you know what merge sort is? Okay, so it's a hierarchical algorithm that will, basically it will, you will keep cutting the array into halves until you get only two elements in the array. You sort these two and then you bubble up and combine the sorted arrays into one bigger one. So now, here you see the yellow color, that's the active thread that's just calculating part of that tree of computation. The black ones are done, the green ones are waiting in the queue and the brown ones are those that are waiting for the children to be finished. And currently we have only one thread, so it's basically depth first uh, search through that tree of computation. I'll speed it up. So now let's try with four threads. So you see fork, uh, fork to an algorithm uh, in real, in, in parallel. So again, we start with an array, we cut it in two, but now we have two colors for two threads. And on the next level we have four colors, well we have only three unfortunately. So four colors for four threads which continue you know, further down the tree. And notice that the colors or threads stick to the subtree. They don't jump across the tree. They just keep, each of them, they keep their own subtree of the whole tree for, for the computation. So basically this is fork join in action. It's a recursive algorithm, but it uses, instead of recursion, it uses, well it creates new tasks for branches. So each time you have to climb a tree structure, or you have to write an algorithm which is divide and conquer type of algorithm, then fork join will be your friend. Now on code level, it's, it's very similar to recursive algorithms, right? So if you have, you have a function that you repeat on every level, so you have a function that, let's say, in, well here's an example that let's say you climb a tree, let's say a tree, a file, a file system, and let's pretend it's loaded in memory because if it's on disk then it's a completely different story. But let's say it's in memory. And now we wanna count all files in that file system. Right, so you have, you have a function that you give a directory and it will count all plain files in that directory. Plus, each time it discovers a subdirectory, it will create a new task. So it will, it will not do recursion, it won't recursively dive into that subdirectory, but it will create a new task to calculate that subdirectory. And then it, it then forgets about it, then it co continues counting files in that local directory. And only when it gets to the, to the very end, only then it is time to collect <coughs> results from the children. So then the thread will wait for all the ch child tasks to finish so that it can take the results from them, add them to the local count and have a result. Now the beauty of this is, that once the thread gets here, it can go and grab another task from its queue. So it doesn't have to block here, waiting passively for the children to finish. What if you have only one thread in your thread pool? Right, so you still need to be able to process the whole hierarchy. We did that, with, with one thread we did the merge sort. So the thread now can go and help the children because it, it, had, it has finished all the stuff that was to be, to be done here. 
It's only the children that need to finish before the thread can continue so it can go and grab another task, probably one of the child tasks, and process those. So once we have fork tune, you can implement very interesting algorithm on top of algorithms on top of the, on top of this, like parallel collections. Now imagine you are given a task. Here's a big array of something, and you have to find the biggest element, like find maximum in a, in a collection. Sequentially, everybody can do it, right? How to do it in parallel? Well, if you have fork join, it's just a matter of doing the same thing we did with file system. Just start a child process on your left branch, on your right branch, or whatever branches you have. Let them calculate local maximums, and then once you get them, well, find the biggest of these two or 32 numbers, and that's the local maximum for, for you that you report to your parent. And if you are the topmost parent, then this is the total maximum. And similarly, you know, for summary and, and other uh, stuff that you typically do with collections. So that's what we have, for example, in GPAS, and something that's coming to Java 8. Now, at the beginning, I, I showed you, well, this particular laptop has four cores. It can run eight threads at a time. But in reality, this laptop has like 160 hardware threads because there's a graphical card which has about 150 cores as well. These are dedicated to certain type of instructions, but it is very fast. So now, there are activities that should allow you sooner or later, use this piece of hardware as well. So these are hidden behind SUDA OpenCL interfaces, which are interfaces that you will use in Java to invoke functions that will run on graphical card in, in your computer. Now, unfortunately, you still have to encode the functions that will run on your, uh, on your graphical card. You have to code them in, in, C, in C code, which is not, very, uh, not a very good situation. It's not very convenient. Fortunately, th there are at least two projects which aim to eliminate that problem. I, I'm especially excited about Sumatra, which is officially sort of supported by Oracle. And uh, it seems like they will try to hide uh, the graphical card in JVM, behind, you know, behind JVM. So you won't, your code won't even know whether, you're, whether the collection processing that you do is running on CPU or GPU. It will be hotspot responsibility to compile your Java code into C and deploy it on the graphical card and run it over there. So once this becomes reality, I think it will be very helpful. Sure. I'm not an expert in that. You can. You know, you can have a server farm with, with graphical cards in them or some chi parallel graphical chips. I mean, theoretically, I'm not an expert in that, so can't tell. Yeah. Yeah, I, I heard about some, yeah. That, yeah. So you can have data mining algorithms specialized for graphical cards, and you can really run them on real servers. So it must be possible to do somehow. And additionally, some in, on some system like, like Mac OS, the CPU can simulate a GPU. So if, if, if on my laptop, if you ask for the number of device or graphical cards, you know, the API will give you back two numbers. One of them, uh, I mean two. One of them is the CPU, the second one is the real GPU. So it can emulate, even if you don't have one, it can emulate one. Okay, so we talked about fork join, about solving hierarchies, about running stuff asynchronously, and about processing collections in parallel. What else can we do to, uh, to get pretty approachable concurrency model? I decided to spend the rest of this talk about, uh, talking about data flow concurrency, because I honestly believe this is a very promising approach. Now, data flow concurrency gives you a model where you get no deadlock, uh, you get no live locks and no uh, race conditions, and you get deterministic deadlock. But now imagine how beautiful a deterministic deadlock is. 
So if you get deadlock in production, you just take the same piece of code, run it, run it against the same data on your laptop, and you get the same deadlock. And now you can analyze. You know, the deadlock doesn't depend on the randomness of thread scheduler. It will always happen at the same place in your code. Now, I'll show you how this is done. Now, in data flow concurrency, it's all based on a very simple uh, principle, on single assignment variables. Ah, it's that simple, isn't it? You've got variables that can be shared across threads. That can, you can only give value to them just once. You can read them many times. If you come too early and there's no value in the variable yet, you just blocked until a value becomes available, just like with futures. And once a value becomes available, well, you get it. And then if you come, you get it immediately. But you can't rewrite the value. You know, it, the value is there forever. But this is enough to give you such a beautiful concurrency model. You just have to restrict <coughs> assignment to variables to be allowed once. Now, this is enough to introduce partial ordering in your, in your code. You know, the, if you have like these four tasks, and so the X data flow variable now introduces partial ordering so that whatever happens in the red part has to happen before whatever happens in the blue part of that computation. It's given, right? Because the blue part cannot start before it can read X. And you cannot read X before X has a value. And well, the value comes from the red <coughs> part. And similarly, then the Z uh, data flow variable imposes ordering between blue and green part. Now, uh, if there was a deadlock, then you would see it here. You would see a loop. So do that, that you would see basically that some piece of code somewhere depends on, uh, I wonder how to, how to draw that graph nicely. Well, you would, you would somehow see that the red part ha can only start when you know, the blue one or the green one finishes, which would be pretty difficult to draw on this kind of graph. But if you represented each, the red, the blue, the green stuff as dots, and then the assignment as arrows, then that would be the right graph to show such a graph, uh, show such a circle. In code, again, this is groovy, but don't worry. So if you have four tasks, you have the main thread and then three asynchronous tasks, now the first task needs x and y in order to a, x and y in order to calculate the z, but since x and y have no value, it cannot continue, so it stops. You don't have to do anything special about stopping it, waiting, or notifying, whatever. Just you, you try to read it. There's no value. Okay, so it will block. Then second and third tasks will eventually write values into y and z, which are uh, x and y, which will eventually trigger the first task to finish its calculation, which will then finish, which will then trigger this, this line so that the main thread can continue. So you see the, the data sort of flow from one task to another without any extra effort. I've got a demo on this. You know, when I was preparing this show some time ago, they told me a good way to make presentation attractive is to mention someone famous. So I decided to go with Albert Einstein. Is he famous enough? Yeah. He, he got that formula, energy equals mass times <coughs> speed of light squared. So I'll use that to calculate energy in a human being. And I'll do it in a multi-threaded way, obviously. I just need to sort out this resolution a little bit. OK, so I, I've done some preparation, but don't worry. So I'll type code right here. It's okay, I need a multi-threaded application to calculate energy in, in, a, in a human being. So, I need a task. And the first task will run asynchronous and will collect data from the user. So I'll ask for, for wait. And now I'll read the, the answer. And now the answer, whatever the user writes in, I'll take it as a number, as an integer, and I'll store it in data flow variable, mass. Now I need that variable, obviously. Ah. 
So it's a data flow variable. I'll move it up here. And now I'll write the answer. So I'll read the data flow variable energy, which I have to have as well. So basically, I write a number into mass, and I read the answer from energy. And I don't care how it happens that after I write something into mass, and energy happens to be in there. You know, I, my responsibility, I mean the responsibility of this task, is to communi communicate with the user, not to take care of the calculation. Mass and energy are the communication points for this task. So I can have another task that will just wait for mass to have a value and do the calculation. So speed of light squared, and it needs to go into energy. That's it. So we have two tasks. One of them writes into mass, reads from energy. The other one reads from from uh, one of them reads uh, right into mass, reads from energy. The other one reads from mass and writes into energy. That should be enough if I run this code. So here's the question. So I write some number and I get the answer. So this works. But obviously, data flow variables put no connection between the consumer and producer. So we can have multiple consumers there. So we could have another task, for example, that will also read mass and do something with it. Like um, giving a suggestion about someone being overweight reading the mass. So like if, if you are shorter than, and now my magic formula, mass, plus 100 in centimeters, you should exercise more. <laughs> Looks like I'm off the screen, but hopefully it is there. So now when I run the code and type in the value, I should get two answers on the output because both tasks write to the, to the output. Now, data flow variables also allow me to register callbacks. So I might say energy then, meaning you know, when energy has a value, then I might want to do something. Like again, print line. Energy has been calculated. Obviously, I could get the value as a parameter here if I wanted to use it for some reason. So that, that's basically a callback function that will get invoked once energy has a value. Now we get three answers, and so on and so forth. So now you should have an idea how to use data flow variables to communicate among multiple uh, threads and or, or tasks. I consider data flow variables a very useful, small uh, concept that can be used across you know, other concepts, concurrency concepts. And not surprisingly, you can, use, uh, you can see uh, data flow variables or similar concepts typically named like promises or futures in other languages. So Clojure has them. Scala has them. Uh, I believe Dart, although I'm not an expert, has something at least very close to this. So other languages have this approach, uh, I mean, follow this approach as well. And Java 1.8 is coming with a, a class called uh, Extended Future or Completable Future, I think is the right name, which is exactly this. You know, so this is not off the mark. This is something that is probably gonna become mainstream soon. At least I hope so because it can be used to build 
interesting abstractions on top of it, like, for example, asynchronous functions. You know, if you look at this piece of code, you know, this is normal sort of functional code. I've got a couple of functions like download, load file, um, hash, and compare. And basically, the, the, the purpose of this script is to compare a hash code of, of a web page and my local file, whether they are identical or not. If not, I probably have to update my web page. Simple. However, why do we have to wait with loading up the file until we finish downloading and calculating the hash code on the first line? These two activities are independent. We just can't do anything about it. We can swap lines if it helps, but still, that would just be sequential code. We can't put them side by side saying, well, these two pieces of the code are totally independent. They can be run in parallel. There's no way we can do it, unfortunately. Well, in Groovy, we did certain compile time trick that we can do it now. Basically, we turn the functions into asynchronous functions, and we use promises to enable this. Right? So we have, so again, the same piece of code, exactly the same piece of code, but now the functions are asynchronous. You know, at the top, we, the old hash, old compare, old download, these are the original functions. Now we create new ones, we just reuse the name, which are asynchronous. So now when we run the script, it will just go through and stop on this last line where we want to get the total result. So we plug here. And these two will run, all, these all functions will run in parallel and they will eventually finish and they will give us a result that we can print. And the magic is based on promises. You know, we change at compile time, we change the original functions, like the hash function, for example, which originally took a string and returns an integer. We change it into a new function which still accepts string, but can also accept promise for a string, and returns back a promise for an integer. So now you see the hooks, right? Each function accepts promises, returns promises, so you can call one on the result of another, and it's up to them to decide, you know, or to wait for the promises to have values so that they can start their own calculation. So when you invoke that script, there are only two functions in that script that can start immediately. It's download and load file since they have parameters, all of them. So download and load file will go to the thread pool, they will pick a thread. Now notice, if you, if you provide a thread, uh, a thread pool with just one thread, it will still work, it will just be slower. So you can throttle the, the parallelism in that piece of code. So they will pick a thread, they will do whatever they are supposed to do, and then, we'll, then they will bound the promise that they returned early that it has a concrete value, so the hash function can continue. So the hash function will then go for a thread and continue, and then it will inform compare, so compare will pick a thread and continue and do the computation. And, and these functions don't block threads, so you can, hope, you, you can run it with one thread, no matter how complex your computation is, it will still run. So you can turn it into sequential, but now sequ sequential execution becomes a special case for parallel execution. Now the beauty of this is that you write the code the same way you did before. You don't have to put in, uh, explicit notes for the compiler, the compiler telling, hey, this can be run in parallel, parallel with respect to this. It will, if there is parallelism, it will be discovered automatically at runtime because the function simply detects, hey, I've got all parameters I can run, so it will run. Well, another possible use of promises is using chaining, which is slightly more imperative style. So you have, let's say, you have URL, which is a string, and you might all promise for a string that you get, and now you might go, then, call download. Once we have a URL, then let's do download. When we are finished downloading, then we can calculate hash. When we have hash, then we can format the result or whatever. Once we have that, we can print the result, and then we can send this as an email somewhere. And these, these are all chained asynchronously to one another. Also, a very important part of this is error handling. So what if download fails? What if there is an exception? Download function throws exception. What happens in that chain? Well, in our case, the exception will just bubble through the call stack down to this print error, and this handler will handle it. So the print error is a function that says, well, I'm looking for malformed URL or whatever exception, so it will get it and will handle it somehow. So like try catch, you just handle it on the level where you are uh, where you are able to handle that exception. 
So then, uh, so then you could rewrite the the example we had in a functional style in a more imperative style, and it would look somewhat like this. So basically, we have two independent lines: downloading stuff and then calculating hash, loading file and then calculating hash. <laughs> and well, when both finish, which is the when all bound, then we compare them, and then when it's compared, we print the result. So that's just a more imperative way to rewrite the same, the same stuff. And it's all based on promises, on the concept of data flow variables or promises or futures. Okay, that's it. So I hope I, I managed through this uh, presentation to convince, convince you that uh, multi uh, parallelism is uh, not hard, uh, multi-threading is. So I would like to, uh, you know, for all of us to kind of get to the higher level and instead of dealing with multi-threading to really focus on parallelism or even better, use parallelism so that we can focus on our applic application domain. Okay, time for your questions. No, 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 it can be used for any language. Well, Jeepers, well, I started Jeepers because I was interested in Groovy. So, you know, I designed this concurrency library for Groovy because there was a concurrency library for Scala and for others, and I wanted to play with Groovy. But you can grab the Java file and you call this directly from Java. It's just, you know, more boilerplate, boilerplate code around it. But, you know, you can use even Jeepers directly from Java, and by design, I mean, the principles can be used in any programming language. I mean, there's nothing specific to Groovy in that. That's why I thought this is good for the Java presentation. Oh, did I answer the question? Yeah. Okay, good. Right, as far as I know, I only monitor what's happening and I might not have the most precise information, but I know they are working on something called a completable future, which is pretty much like future with some extra, extra stuff like callbacks. So now you can get a future, yeah, you submit a task to, to a threat pool, you get back a future, but now you can register a callback you know, a Lambda or some runnable that will get executed once that uh, asynchronous calculation finishes. So that's at least one thing that will be in Java 8. Fork join is already in Java 7 and it's just being improved and will be probably much more performant in version uh, Java 8. And they also uh, will support parallel collections in Java 8. I, I think we, uh, I think it was mentioned in one of the earlier presentations here. Okay, oh, all right. Do you know about any uh, data flow framework for Java? Specifically for Java, no. You could use GPaaS from Java. It has Java API. But, you know, it's not an ideal solution, obviously. Apart from that, I know about commercial solutions, but not about anything that would be really like a library for Java itself. Okay, all right. Based on your experience implementing those uh, frameworks, uh, what changes or how hard it is to uh, deal with errors? So you, you, you just showed one example, mm -hmm. you the chaining, and in one step you were catching the error. But there are many ways how you can you know, write the asynchronous code, as, as we have seen. And how hard is it to think about catching errors and mm -hmm. figure it out what exactly happened and how to at that point in time to stop all asynchronous tasks that are running because it gives resources to right. it. Uh -huh. How hard is it? That is very difficult. I mean, in general. general. Uh, if you take, for example, parallel collections, you know, that's the most easy to use uh, abstraction. So you have a collection and you say, like, find maximum, for example. Now, one of the branches will throw an exception somewhere. But you know, there are some other branches being calculated and you know, 
it's it's difficult to stop them. You as a user, you have no influence over that. You just call that method and you get back exception at some point. If the library is implemented correctly, you get back exceptional collection of exceptions that happened. But you know, the computation will finish depending on you know, how they implemented the underlying machinery. And typically, they will just let all the branches complete. And then they will realize, well, there were some exceptions, so we will throw an exception. It could be a problem if you do something that takes quite a lot of time, right? Let's say you, you run in, you like, you run four parallel computations, each of them takes a day, and then if one of them crashes, you will still have those other three running for a day. So, you know, the next day we will realize we got one exception and three results. If it's a problem for you, then you would probably have to do something. I know this is not a satisfactory uh, answer, and that's because I don't really have a satisfactory answer that would work in general. Uh, yeah, for data flow, it is pretty straightforward. As you see, you can just register a handler. Or for actors, the same thing. Well, you can register, um, you can register an error handler that will get notified when an error happens. But now, how to stop the other actors or how to stop the whole computation? And that's the most challenging task. Okay. Okay, very good question. Uh, I had exactly the same thought when I saw the slide in the closure talk. They had the PMAP thing, which created you know, a lot of threads, like millions, well, not millions, but a lot of threads, which caused the calculation to be very slow. Uh, well, in Jeepers, all the abstractions are bound to a thread pool. So you create a thread pool of some size, like eight threads, in my case, would be probably optimum, and you never get more than eight threads. So even if your collection is huge, it will still use those eight threads, not more. It won't create thousands of threads. So that problem it shouldn't happen. In, I mean, it, that, we don't have that problem in Jeepers, and I assume it, it, even in Clojure, they should do something about it if they have something like that. If PMAP creates... Well, and he told that it's possible to set up some pool threads. So okay, so they can... Is, is the same that yeah. yeah, you can always customize the thread pool that will be used. Right? I didn't bother with that code, but I could say, like, you, you know, when I run it on, on a thread pool with two threads, for example. Uh, the other part of that question is how to, uh, for example, if we go back to fork join, if you remember the tree, uh, now how, how fine grained this should, go, this should be, right? If you have a fork join algorithm that, uh, yeah, I was too aggressive pushing the button. But, you know, if you have a fork join algorithm which kind of splits the array into smaller, smaller, smaller pieces, now how far should you go? If you have eight threads, should you only go to the level where you have eight, eight chunks and do them sequentially, or should you go further down? And, well, the general... Oh, out of time. Okay, so I'll answer it offline. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> can't do it. Uh, okay, well, thanks for coming, gentlemen. Dobra, to nas się beru, to chyba się.